It's good to be back with you for a Lend Talk, which is about a Lend book. And so these are a series of Lend books where I go through my uh, repertoire of, of books and publications and tell a backstory about every one of them. And there's a lot of backstories to this one. This is the one I'm going to do today. It's called So Beautiful, Divine Design for Life and the Church. My first design book. Now, some people say this is my best book. I don't think so, because your, the author thinks his best books are the most recent books. But this book did set up the my most recent book, Designer Jesus, the life story of a disciple of Jesus Christ. So um, it, it is kind of in that trajectory, and I'm not sure I would have done the Designer Jesus book without this so beautiful. But it's, it's a book that's born of frustrations, a series of frustrations. And the beginning one was Jesus is still a rock of ages. But everywhere I look, much of the church is on the rocks. We're on the rocks shattered on the shoals of change. We're on the rocks watering down and diluting the gospel. We're on the rocks addicted to diversions and detours. We're on the rocks, taking direct, direct hits from rock throwers. So the question became, for me, back in the mid-aughts, the beginning of the 21st century, that decade called the aughts or the noughts, <laughs> uh, are you on the rocks or are you on the rock? And the reason why the church is on the rocks is that it hasn't been on the rock. On Christ the solid rock I stand. All other ground is fleeting sand. I have a granite confidence in the rock of ages. But how do you convey that foundation stone, if you will, that cornerstone? What is the foundation on which we stand? And part of my encouragement here and, and out of that frustration was born a realization that I needed to convey better the fact that the mission is God's mission, not the church's mission. That's this concept of missio dei. Um, and it is God's mission. It's not the church's mission. You never talk about the mission of the church because it's God's mission. The question is, is God's mission going to have a church? And so my, my uh, despair and, and depression about a church on the rocks became um, kind of countered and challenged and convicted by the fact that there's five words that rebuke that despair, discontentment, and discomfort. The battle is not yours. Second Chronicles 2015. The battle is not yours. It's God's mission, and God will be in this future, whether we are or not, and whether the, our churches and our tribes are or not, and our denominations are or not. It's God's mission. It's God's battle. The battle is not yours. And so these five words began to rebuke my lordliness and my discomfort, my sagging shoulders, my sagging spirit. So I began to inhabit that, that sense of what does it mean that we are part of the missio dei, a, a notion that some people say originated in Karl Barth's address at the Brandenburg Mission Conference in 1931. That the, coin, the phrase was actually coined in 1934, Missio Dei, but it's a, it's a concept that's intrinsic to, to the Bible. It's God's mission. A church of mission is the mission of the church. And one of my favorite and most uh, um, formative books for me, David Bosch, the South African missiologist, his book, Transforming Mission, uh, just changed everything for me. It's not, it was published in 1991, now translated in, in 
dozens of languages. Um, so this, this sense of despair, discontentment. Um, but the second frustration is not just the church on the rocks needed to rediscover the rock and to be on the rock. The, the Great Commission uh, it has become the great omission. And this really frustrated me as I saw the, the, the church who abandoned the mission language, by the way, in the 70s and 80s, but 60s, 70s, and 80s, but picked it up again when the business corporate culture started doing mission statements. And suddenly, oh, we can use that word mission again. And so every church had to have a mission statement. And I, I, one church that I know of spent two years deliberating, discussing, and perfecting the document of its mission statement. I'm, and I'm tearing my hair out of here. Um, didn't Jesus give us a mission statement? Why do we have to come up with our own? Um, now, when you look at the one he gave us, you know why we might have to come up with our own, because we didn't like the one we got. But... We have a mission statement. It's in Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, in various forms. The, the locus classicus, the definitive form of it, is, of course, in Matthew. Jesus' final words, Matthew 28, verses 16 to 20. Jesus gave us a mission statement. Go into all the world. Make disciples of Jesus Christ. And then of all cultures, never say nations, because when people think of nations, they think of nation states. You don't have nation states until the 17th century. Nation state is a modern concept. So it, it's misleading. We're, all, we're talking about people groups. We're talking about cultures here. Now, there's some people say, well, I'm not a great commission person. I'm a great commandment person. And you, you know the great commandment, thou shalt love the Lord your God. The two great commandments, Jesus said, and one is like unto it. Uh, first great commandment, second great commandment, but they're all one great commandment. You, commandment. you love the Lord your God with all of your heart, mind, soul, strength, and then you love your neighbor as yourself. But the great commandment is implicit in the Great Commission, where it says, make disciples of Jesus. Make followers of Jesus. And if you make a follower of Jesus, he that's what it means to be a follower, is to live the great commandment. So I, I, I don't see any difference. Um, between, I see the great commandment within the more comprehensive great commission. Um, a, a, a word, by the way, that is not in the Bible. Again, um, a, a word, um, a phrase first used in the 17th century by a Dutch missionary by the name of Justinian von Veltz. Um, but we can st it's still go into all the world, make disciples of all, of all cultures, disciples of Jesus of all cultures. And the more I looked at this and thought about this, I realized this is the one and only mission statement for the Church of Jesus Christ. This is the Church's one mission statement, the original mission statement, the OS, if mission statement, meaning the operating system mission statement. And that's when I realized I had to write a book about this, and it came out as, as so beautiful. The, I'd written many books where I explored and alluded to and lifted up the cultural interface that works with digital culture. In other words, anything, every culture has its own unique interface and digital culture has its own unique interface. And I, I use the acronym EPIC, E-P-I-C. I'd, I'd written a whole book on Epic, and then I try to particularize it with the Gospel according to Starbucks, and we'll talk about that in another Len talk. Uh, I first introduced postmodern pilgrims, and and then I I built on it in Aqua Church, and and, and um, I also mentioned it in Soul Tsunami, and, and so I'm trying to. This is the anything that wor works with the digital culture has got to become experiential, participatory, image-rich, connected, Epic. 
And so we, we had, and, and I had this mantra, turn activities into epictivities. And, and um, you see churches back then beginning called epic churches and epic and epic became, so everybody's trying, every, we started to explore. I think it's even now people are rediscovering it and realize, wow, this really does work. I, I'm not sure how many, many more years the epic interface has because interfaces come and go. And that's the whole issue here is that an interface just tells you what will work with a culture. But it will work for good and it will work for evil. I mean, one of the greatest masters of the epic interface is Satan. I mean, he's got some of the most epic platforms around that are experiential, participatory, image-rich, connective. Don't go there, but porn sites are, are tremendously epic. Video games, hugely epic. One of the reasons why video games rake in more money than all the motion picture industry does. So I spent all this time doing Epic, but Epic is morally neutral. It can be, you can hook it up to anything, good or bad, and it'll work. The church has failed to understand that. But all of a sudden I realized, wait a minute, but there's something that isn't, doesn't change. It's got to stay the same. And it's every interface operate has an operating system, the OS. And what's the OS for the church? And then I realized I am not, that's it. We have an operating system for Christianity, for the church. And it's right here in this great commission commandment statement. Go into all the world, missional. Make disciples of Jesus Christ, relational. Of all cultures, incarnational, MRI. Missional, relational, incarnational, MRI. Now, I could spend some other time, and I did another book on the magnetic resonance imaging and how those words, those metaphors, have tremendous uh, power. And we'll talk about that in another Len book. But this is an easy way to remember it. But the MRI is the good, true, and beautiful default for the church. The problem is the church is in a bad default. Even if it does do epic, it's, it's doing epic in an alien default. Because we've not been doing missional we've been doing attractional that's why we would come up with our own mission statements we didn't do how do you send better disciples out in the world go we did how do you get more people to come so it was an attractional not a missional and we weren't doing relational make disciples we were doing propositional intellectually comprehend and understand that the lord is good not trust and see that the lord is good we, we weren't thinking about truth as a person who calls us into a relationship. That's what a disciple of Jesus means. And then, the third one. We weren't doing incarnational so much as colonial. When we did try and uh, bring Jesus, which is a bad metaphor, but let me just, don't, let me not argue with it here, <laughs> okay. Quote, bring Jesus to another culture. Uh, the real metaphor should be discover what Jesus is already doing in that culture. But we did it in a colonialist way. Um, can I tell you about my Jesus? Can I tell you my story and how much Jesus means to me? Can I introduce you to my Jesus? And let me tell you, Jesus is doing something different in every one of us. And, and we try and colonize um, our image of Jesus into somebody else rather than learn from what Jesus wants to do in their life and how that might inform my experience of Christ. And so instead of doing MRI, we've been in an APC, Attractional Propositional Colonial. Um, and so I realized I had to do this, I had to do this book and hence it's divided into three parts. Uh, all good things are in threes. <laughs> so you got missional, about a third of the book, relational, about a third of the book, and propositional, 
about a third of the book. I, I'm going to give you a little kind of um, inside scoop here, and I'm not betraying any trust or anything here, but I want to explain why I, what kind of was my pole star um, as I was writing the relational component. Of course, the, the North Star is Christ, the pole star. But I had a person in mind as I wrote that relational component. And that person in mind is the person I dedicated the book to. And here's a backstory. I used to do advances in mountain settings and water settings. And when I was doing advances in the hills of West Virginia, specifically Canaan Valley, um, Davis, Thomas, West Virginia. Um, one of the people I did it with is a friend, colleague. We've done, we've been on platforms together. We made trips. We did a, a Wittenberg conference together, and I love him dearly, Alan Hirsch. Alan Hirsch comes from a Jewish background, born in Johannesburg, South Africa. And so we were talking about in, in, in this advance, I don't, I don't like the word retreat, in my, in my home, I think, I'm not sure where they had my store back then. I think I did, but we may have done part of it in the Sweets Mountains, Mountain and Body and Mountain Store, um, the Soul Cafe in uh, Thomas, West Virginia. But this is when Tony Campolo was starting his red letter stuff, his red letter Bible. And I know Tony too, and, and I would argue with Tony and, and say, Tony, this is, you don't get it. The uniqueness of Jesus is not his teachings. What, what is all this about his teachings? I mean, this red letter idea, we're gonna have a very little Bible, we're gonna focus on the red letters. Well, will you, it's just like what Thomas Jefferson did with the Jefferson Bible. He sat by his fireplace one night, took, took a bunch of scissors and scissored out all of the things that, all the miracles and all the strange, what he thought were strange stuff, and he just kept his teachings. And I'm like, so I was arguing with Tony. And, and so I got this wonderful interplay, uh, this dialogue with Alan, who, who, was, who was defending uh, Tony and his red letter, and, and, um, and I, I'm, I was arguing with it. And um, just say why I didn't like it, and Alan was telling me why he liked it. And it was, you know, well, we, we got to live by the teachings of Jesus. And, well, yes, but the uniqueness of Jesus is not as his teachings. And, and, and his, his Jewish background, you know, it's all about the, the commandments and the, you know, the law. But in a true understanding, for me, the law is not about laws, but it's a, the law is there to reveal the heart of the lawgiver. And, and Jesus is the fulfillment of the law. He's the living Torah. He's embodied Torah. So that teaching and teacher become one. So it's all about the teacher. And so I, Al and I were arguing about this. And, um, and that's what I saw that his, his Jewish background kind of, kind of coming through here. Um, and and um, in making, which is one of one of the reasons he was defending, I think, this red letter edition, which still, I mean, red letter Christian. Um, I I wouldn't. I would. We were talking. About, are you going to sign this? I said no. I'm not going to sign the red letter uh, manifesto. Now, Paul wouldn't sign the red letter manifesto. Paul, the earliest interpreter of Jesus, was almost totally disinterested in his teachings because his teachings just took the best of Judaism and brought them all together. He's embodied to himself. He takes the best of Judaism. Everything Jesus taught, you can find somewhere in the Jewish heritage. Um, he's just bringing the best of Judaism together and embodying that, incarnating that in himself. He is living Torah. Jesus is embodied Torah. I'm tearing my hair out. <laughs> and, uh, um, and, and Paul is the first interpreter of Jesus. But Paul, what Paul can't stop talking about, what Paul is passionate about, is what Jesus did. He died on a cross. 
he rose from the dead. Um, he, he ascended into heaven. He, 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 he's reigning at the right hand of the Father, and he's returning. What Paul can't, this is the Apostles' Creed. This is, the, this is what is unique about Jesus. For us, truth is not a, a set of red letter teachings. It's a person, the teacher, the rabbi, the Messiah. And, and we follow, not yes, we follow the teachings, but the teachings come in a teacher. And the reason why both liberals and conservatives want to get rid of uh, the focus on the teachings, because then if you got all the teachings, you don't need the teacher. You don't have to deal with that person of Christ. You can just deal with the teachings of Jesus. And of course, there go his miracles, there go his his divinity, and all that kind of stuff. So I'm going, no, no, no. And Al says, no, no, you're 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 worried about nothing, Len. You know. But I wrote this middle section on the relational component, um, and dedicated the book. So I figure maybe if I dedicate the book to Alan, he might read it. So, <laughs> so I, I dedicate the book to my friend and colleague, and uh, I call him Sensei of the Spirit, uh, Alan Hirsch. But I really had in mind a lot of my fellow Christians and colleagues, my brothers and sisters, who, who haven't yet grasped how weird Christians are in their understanding of truth. We, we are the only people on this planet following a definition of truth that is not principles, propositions, practices, but a person. Um, this, is, this is what, and the problem is we have a weird definition of truth and we're not weird enough because we, we settle into all these other understandings of what truth is. There is no other God where you can say, he touched me. Nor the Gaither him. He touched me. Oh, he touched me. You would never say that of a philosopher like Aristotle or um, Buddha or Confucius or Plato or Muhammad, only Jesus. Only Jesus. Because Jesus is not a principle. Jesus is not a proposition. Jesus is a person who calls us into a relationship. Um, and the best we got in Christianity, for much of it, is he talked to me, or he, he taught me, and not he touched me. It's all about this living relationship with a person who's alive and wants to live his resurrection life in and through us. In Christ. I mean, how many times does Paul say in Christ? 164 times? Even Paul operates, not propositionally, but relationally. We just have to read Paul the right way. So, hence this book. Um, a, a book that introduces uh, the reader to what is the original operating system for the Christian faith. And it's not attractional, propositional, and colonial. It is missional, go into all the world. Make disciples of Jesus Christ, relational, and I, incarnational, of all cultures. Jesus the Christ will incarnate himself differently in every culture, and there are certain things about Jesus I will never know until I experience the risen Christ in Inuit culture, in uh, Swahili culture, in all the cultures of the world. And that's why the double helix DNA 
the so beautiful design for the body of Christ, the DNA, which is the best translation of Logos, the DNA of the divine. Thank you for listening to me um, rant a little bit about the backstory of why I wrote and how I wrote this book, So Beautiful.